This is part two of an interview with James L. Mullins, Dean of Libraries, by Sammy Morris. The date is November 7th, 7th 2017, and this is an oral history for the Purdue Libraries. No, it's not November 7th. Oral history program. We are confused on the date, and we'll amend that later. I think it's November 6th. <laughs> We think it's November 6th. It's a Monday. So, Jim, um, when we left off, you were talking about your position in the law library at IU, and I think we reached up to about 1974-75. Where does that pick up in terms of your transition to South Bend? Well, I realize now before that I needed to mention when I decided to work on a Ph.D. Ah, yes. Um, so what prompted that? Well, um, you did talk, I'm sorry, I do remember you talking about um, turning down a scholarship to Princeton. Oh, that's when I was still and, at Iowa, Okay. when I went to library school. And you went to library school, and then you entered the Ph.D. program at IU Bloomington in 75. Mm -hmm. Did we talk about that at all? Maybe not. I don't think we did. Um, Let's pick up there. Well, while I was at Bloomington and I was working as the classifier, um, the... Um, I started realizing that I wanted to get another degree. And as I mentioned earlier, I had been planning on going for a doctorate um, when I was leaving undergrad. And But I always said, well, I'll go someday to get another degree. So while I was at Bloomington the first year, I was debating whether to do an MBA, a PhD in history, a law degree, or a PhD in library administration. And when I considered the options, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a law librarian because it's too narrow. I wanted to have more of a, a relationship to the breadth and scope of a university. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get a PhD in history, even though I love history. I just didn't see that as being what I wanted to spend my life doing. It might end up making me not like history. And I didn't want to do an MBA because it just seemed to be too focused on producing uh, commercial success as opposed to something that was more scholarly. Mm -hmm. So I decided I would do the library PhD. and But I still had a real interest in law. So I was, I was the first and maybe only person they've ever had who ended up getting um, a specialty or a minor. They don't really have minors in a PhD, but um, I ended up with hours in law school counting towards my PhD and ultimately my um, dissertation committee one of the members on it was the dean of the law school which was in and of itself problematic uh, because you don't do legal research the same as you do research for a, a quantitative analysis which mm -hmm. is what I was doing my dissertation dealt with the the mm, conflict between whether a law library should be a part of the university library system or part of the law school. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of arguments going back and forth at the time that the law library needed to be part of the law school. And and there were a lot of oh, arguments being made without, without any kind of substantive uh, documentation to prove whether it was better or not. So my dissertation dealt with uh, the, um, I followed the growth rate patterns of the law schools that were accredited in 1932 by the American Bar Association, and I followed them all the way through until 1976 to determine what their growth rate patterns were. And then I used what was called the critical incident technique, and I applied those in critical incidents onto the growth rate pattern of each one of the law libraries. And the, the, fa the incidents were the, um, whether they were both, whether they were autonomous or integrated, which was the terms we used, um, whether they're the change in law library and the change of library director, um, the change in the law school dean, I can't remember now exactly what they all were. And, and then I mapped the growth rate before and after those critical incidents mm -hmm. to determine if there was any significant difference between um, the impact of one of those changes, whether it was the law librarian, the library dean, the, or the law dean, the library director. 
and whether the school became, whether the library transitioned between autonomous to integrated or integrated to autonomous. And I was very disappointed because when I got done, there was no significant difference between the two populations. Mm -hmm. And I was very upset. And my major professor, Dr. David Kayser, said, well, Jim, that is a finding. What you found was there is no difference. And that the only thing that was somewhat significant, and it wasn't significant statistically, was the law librarian, the change in the law librarian. And so it could be argued, although it wouldn't be supported by the data, that the most important and critical person in determining the support for the library was the law librarian. Mm -hmm. And so it helped to clarify um, the fact that one or the other was not necessarily better than the other. Good people can work in, a, in any organization. They can make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I finished. I didn't finish the degree before I left Bloomington. I finished all my coursework and I took my qualifying exams in the summer of 75, at, or 78, summer of 78. I started the doctoral program in September of 75 mm -hmm. and finished all the coursework in, in 78. Um, at that time, IU had a very stringent policy about full-time, uh, and I was actually a library faculty member, I was an assistant professor, um, but allowing time off for any kind of classes. So if I took a class during the day, I had to count how many hours that was, mm -hmm. and it would go against my vacation. And um, so there was about two years where I had no vacation because I gave it all up in order to go to, to school. And what I would do is I would go to bed at around 10 o'clock, wake up at around 4, 4.30, do any writing, any reading I needed to do, and then take a nap, then go to work, then come home, take another nap, and then continue working in the evenings. And that's how I was able to get through it. Mm -hmm. um, you can do anything for three or four years. Um, but it was still at that time that I really, really wanted to be a director. Uh, I've always had this tendency to want to be in charge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not the best committee person. I'm much better the chair of a committee. Um, and so I, I really wanted to be the director. When I was at the law library in Bloomington, I got along very, very well with the director of the law library, Betty Liebes. And it was, it was an interesting thing to observe because she was obviously a woman and she had a law degree and a library degree, graduated from the University of Washington in the late 40s. And at that time, there was just no way she could become a lawyer. It just wasn't done and it was highly unusual. So she became a law librarian. And I realized that there were at least half of all the law librarians, if not more, were women. And, and it was primarily because they were shut out from um, other law positions, law faculty positions. And, and the library was seen as the place for um, a, library, or a, a woman who was a librarian or woman lawyer. And uh, so I realized there was such a, a waste of talent. Although being a librarian is not being a waste, um, it could have been, the options could have been different. And so anyway, I, I, I observed something when I was down there, and that is that there was such a still uh, chauvinistic world, and this was 40 years ago, and because we would be sitting in a meeting um, and we may, might be talking to a salesman and here I was a very lowly young librarian but I was the only male at the table and the salesman usually was a male he would be talking to me and not talking to the law librarian mm -hmm. and so he would be looking at me and I would turn my eyes and my <laughs> head over to her to tell him he should be talking to her mm -hmm. not to me once in a while, they would get it. Most of the time, they didn't. Mm -hmm. And she would be leaning over towards me, trying to get his attention. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, how awful, because she was a smart, smart person. And for someone just to assume 
that the male is the person in charge just is amazing to me. Hopefully those things have changed. Were there very many other men in the library school program when you were in there? Yes, there were. Um, I was at Iowa mm -hmm. and uh, when I did my master's, and there were at least a third okay. of the students were men. Um, and when I started the doctoral program in Bloomington, and I took courses with master's degree students, in the, mat in the doctoral program, it was probably 75% male, mm, okay. and uh, only about 25% female. And in the master's program, there were, it was probably about like the percentages of 20% male. Brian Schottlander, who became a very well-known and highly respected university librarian, at the University of California, San Diego, was a master's degree student when I was a doctoral student. So I've known him 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and Barbara Dewey, who's the dean at Penn State, was in charge of, of uh, recruit or human resources when I was in the doctoral program, which is 40 years ago. So um, there are some people that I've known for a long, long period of time. So anyway, as I said, I wanted to be a director. Mm -hmm. And so the options of, of doing that were not great. Um, I interviewed at the law library at the University, or Washington University in St. Louis, not as the law librarian, but as the associate law librarian. But without a law degree, my options were going to be limited. Even mm -hmm. if I had a PhD, it was going to be limited because they required that the law librarian have a joint law degree and, and library degree. And I interviewed at Northwestern at the law school there. And the law librarian was, was recruiting me to be um, the associate to follow up behind him when he retired. And, and I raised the question about that I don't think that I could do that. And he said, I would argue that your PhD is equivalent to the law degree. But I didn't didn't do it, mm -hmm. so I realized what, where I wanted to go was the libraries, and so the IU South Bend Library was being advertised, and the IU South Bend Library had an extremely bad um, reputation. Mm -hmm. um, it was the pre the former director that was removed as director. The library had gotten into very bad financial condition. Um, it was sitting in a in a building that was kind of a temporary location with a plan to build a new building or to renovate a building. And it was highly mm, unlikely that, that it was going to happen. But a lot of the people in the library were temporary. They were um, on um, interim appointments. And... And I think it's only for that reason that I got it. Because mm. here I was, 28 years old, and most of the people in the libraries were older than me. And I, I got the position. Well, there was a woman working in the library who was the interim director, and she was also a candidate for the director's position. Mm. And she had been a librarian there, and she um, had left to raise a family, but but they brought her back to be interim when they let go of the other other librarian. And but the campus chose me. And she was also applying for the assistant director position. Mm -hmm. And there was another person who was really much, much better, a young woman who I was very impressed with. So I went and told the provost that I was going to choose this other woman. He said, Well then you go over and tell Kathy, her name is Kathy, that you're not going to choose her. And I thought, oh my God, wow. I've got to go over and tell this other this woman who's who stepped in to do a lot of to do a lot of cleanup mm -hmm. that I wasn't going to select her as the assistant director. And he said, well, that's the res responsibility you've got to take. So I did, and to this day, I've always been so impressed with her response. Um, she took it very well, and she said, that's your decision to make. And she said, I'll respect it. We actually ended up becoming professional friends. She mm -hmm. stayed in the community. So um, anyway, the library up there was real bizarre. Um, had almost no money. Uh, when I got there, I found out that we had bills that were outstanding for two years. Oh, goodness. And, uh, and so we had to, 
I had to go to the university library committee and tell them, we have got to pay all of our bills current. And I said, and that means we buy no books this next year. Well, the library committee was furious. And, and I said, how can you argue with this? Mm -hmm. We have to pay bills. And so for one year, we didn't buy any books just to get ourselves current. Mm -hmm. And then we finally got ourselves current. We got the campus or the administration, at least, to feel that we were in control again. Because mm -hmm. they had just pretty much stopped giving the library money because it was apparent that there was mismanagement. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got the library current. Well, during this time, we were also trying to uh, argue for a, a renovated space. And there was a building that the university and the state had purchased that was going to be um, converted into the library. But it was a computer center for this big company. And the, com the company said, if you make us move out of that building, we'll leave South Bend. And there were like 200 employees in the building. So there was a lot of pressure for us to allow them to stay. Well, the only way we could do that is if we um, got the state and donors from the community to um, give us the funds to, in order to build a new building, mm -hmm. and we did. Um, the state gave us, I mean, the whole project, I think, was $8 million. The state gave us maybe 3 to $5 million, and, uh, and then one of the donors, big, um, well-respected donors in the community, Franklin Schurz, um gave us a lead gift, and we named the library after him, the Franklin Schurz Library. And we built that building, broke ground in 86, and it was completed in 88, and used a very well-known architect, Frank Edward Larrabee Barnes, out of New York mm -hmm. City. And, uh, and it turned out to be a good building, and it still, even though the building is now over 30 years old, still holds its own pretty mm -hmm. well. Um, and that was the, the culmination of my years there. The other thing that happened during that time is when I met Kathy, my wife. Oh, yes. Tell me about that. And them. so we met on a blind date. <laughs> um, friends of ours asked us both to dinner. And I had known of her. Um, she had been dating this one professor at um, IUSB. Um, and... And I remember seeing her running up the stairs um, in the administration building, and I turned to somebody and I said, who's that? <laughs> and they said, oh, that's Kathy Stiso. And, and she was just so full of life and dynamic. And, and they said, well, she's dating Tom Vanderbilt. And so I didn't think anything more about it. Well, I don't know how many months later... Uh, this couple invited Kathy and me to dinner, and we hit it off. She had evidently broken up with, um, well, he started seeing somebody else. And so we hit it off, and, and within a few months we were engaged, and then within a year we were married. That's fast. And, uh, and so that was in 85, 86. We got married in 86. And, uh, and Kathy had one son, uh, Michael, and he was about 14 at the time and uh, so they moved in with me at the house that I had restored I, I restored an old house in South Bend during this time that was going to be demolished and an 1880s Italian aid I bought it for $16,000 and um, in a part of town that had declined and was very very debt ridden or not debt ridden crime ridden and um the house had been abandoned for about two years, and the plumbing had all burst, windows were broken, and I went in and bought it for $16,500 and got a loan on it, which is quite amazing, and um, restored it. And it went on to the, the it was declared a local landmark. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I moved another carriage house onto the property that was going to be demolished elsewhere in about 82. And, uh, and added that to the property as well, and that was on the National Register of Historic Districts. It's in the, the West Washington National Historic District in South Bend. And I was very involved in the, in the Neighborhood Association and was president for I don't know how many years while I was in South Bend. Um, so between when you started at South Bend in 1978 
then you you had this major building built in the 80s. I, I forgot. Eight, it, was, it started in 86, and 86. it was completed in 88. And you got your Ph.D. while working as a director. Got that in 84. In 84. And then you got married in 86, and somewhere in there you renovated a house. Oh, I renovated a <laughs> house from 79 to about 82. So it sounds like you've always been a very busy person. Oh, yeah. Well, as I said, my mother was determined that we would always be working. And so that was kind of the, the gist of it. The area of town that we, that the house was in was primarily a black neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of the few whites living in the neighborhood. And it was really a great, great experience because it helped me to dispel any final prejudices that I may have had uh, from growing up in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And because I learned and got to meet such wonderful, wonderful people. And so it, it really did help. Is that um, neighborhood still known as the way it was then? Not quite, no. no. It's it's gentrified quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but we had shootings. Um, I mean, three people were shot just down the street from us. I had a car run into the front of the house. Goodness. The house was broken into, people not kicking in the doors, and, and the garage was burned down. Wow. Um, but on the whole, it was a very good experience. Well, what, what kept your interest in the position at South Bend for almost two decades? I think that's the, probably the longest you've been in any position that I could tell. Yeah. Well, partly it was always because there were new things on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And so the building was always an issue, um, building the Schurz Library. And after that was done in 88, and then after I got married, um, Kathy started working on a big project. Mm -hmm. She was doing, she was building a new museum in South Bend, and and that took a great deal of her time and my, I was supporting her in that. But at the same time, I started looking, because Kathy made the comment to me, do you really want to stay with IU until you retire? It would be, at that time, it would have been 42 years mm -hmm. that I would have been with IU. And she said, don't you want to try something else? So I would interview at other places. And I would come back and say, nope, because I was now a full professor. Mm -hmm. I would come back and say, nope, it's no better. Um, and, and her project was going on, and it took a great deal of her time. And I knew that she needed to stay there until that project was done. Plus, Michael, our son, was um, graduated from high school in 88 and started college at Purdue in 88. So he was down here from 88 till 93. And so as long as he was here, um, there wasn't any reason. I mean, it wouldn't have been a good reason to leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, But after he graduated and went to, uh, to uh, Oregon to work on a master's, um, then we felt more free. And Kathy's project finished in 90 three as well. Mm -hmm. So then for the next several years, I started looking at options about where I could go and what I would want to do. And I knew that at this time I was in my mid-40s. And I knew that if I were going to make a move, I needed to do it soon. Um, as a sidelight, IU used to have um, a retirement program that people referred to as the golden handcuffs. If you worked for IU for 20 years and 18 of those years you were on their TIA craft plan, at 64 you could retire at full salary for five years and so that uh, and they would still continue paying in 15 percent towards your retirement during those five years so that almost no one stayed after they turned 64, they've now raised, they, they later raised it to 65, but still five years. And, and almost no one stayed after 64. And I can remember this one professor who had just turned 50. He said, Jim, if you're going to leave, you've got to get out of here before you're 50. Mm -hmm. He said, once you hit 50, 64 doesn't look that far away. And I knew people that had opportunities, really great opportunities, but they wouldn't leave because they saw that 64 full salary for five years as such a desirable thing that they wouldn't take the risk and leave. Um, 
So that's when I realized in my 40s that I needed to do that. So um, we looked, and I interviewed at various places. In fact, I interviewed at quite a few places. Um, never getting an offer, I don't believe. I can't remember. No, I don't think I did. And, and it was only when I interviewed at Villanova University in March of 96 that I um, realized that that was a place I really wanted to go to. What attracted you to that? Well, partly it was on the East Coast. I've always wanted, Kathy and I have always wanted to live on the East Coast. We're both Midwesterners. Mm -hmm. And and somehow the East, I've, I'd been going to the East Coast ever since I was early teens because of my brother and sister-in-law, brother and, my brother in New York, my sister in Virginia. And so I always wanted to go and live in the East Coast. And Philadelphia, I didn't know that much about. But Villanova, I knew was, I considered it to be an elite private school. It's a private school. It's not that elite. Um, but it had a very good reputation. The only thing that I wasn't sure about is its Catholic basis. But having been around Notre Dame for so many years, I didn't think that much of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I went out. I liked the place very much. I liked the provost, the dean of faculties there, very much. And he was from Wisconsin originally, Jack Johannes. And he said, we've got to get more Midwesterners out here. <laughs> he said, the work ethic, we need the Midwestern work ethic. Mm -hmm. And I liked him, and, and I was offered the job, and, and I took it. And that created a huge challenge for Kathy and me. Uh, Michael had left to go to Oregon before that, so that was not a problem. But it was knowing that she needed to get a job that was as significant to her as my job was going to be to me. Mm -hmm. And that's always a challenge. And so she made the decision. She would um, take a job that was within six hours of driving of Philadelphia. That We thought we could do a six-hour drive. So she ended up taking... Um, interviewing and getting um, the presidency of Montpelier for the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Orange, Virginia, just outside of Charlottesville, mm -hmm. which on a good day is anywhere between five and six hours from Philadelphia. So we had a, a townhouse in Philadelphia in Chestnut Hill, and we had a house in Orange, Virginia. So that was the start of our commuting lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was kind of nice because Virginia, the horse country, was beautiful. And then she would, she loved the city, so she would come to Philadelphia and we'd spend time there. And Villanova was a very, um, very good experience because it gave me the opportunity to really be my own boss. As long as you were within the IU system as a regional campus, you weren't totally your own boss. Mm -hmm because you still had to coordinate with Bloomington. And so by being at Villanova, finally I could make the decisions about what, um, what was important, as I saw it, for the libraries, as opposed to trying to work within the system to make it work. Um, and I, um, I really saw that as a benefit. The, the library was well supported extremely conservative. Um, the library was not modern. It, it had all the modi modern technology, but it didn't have a very inviting atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I one time said, do you think everybody here is mo are monks or what? Because the place just looked like a, a seminary. Mm -hmm. And so I finally got the university to agree to buy some soft couches and um, in tables and lamps and brought in a lot of greenery and uh, and cleaned up the place considerably. Because I said at that time the students were paying 20 some thousand a year to go to school there and I said it doesn't look like this is a place that's worth 20 some thousand. Um, have, um, was, was there just one library there or was yeah, it part of a... There was system? a business library too. Uh -huh. uh, but otherwise it was just one, the main okay. library. Uh, Villanova is not that large. It's only about 6,000 students. Okay. And uh, very, it's a comprehensive university. Very, very few doctoral programs. Mm -hmm. it's, an, it's associated with the August, the Order of the Augustinians, oh, okay. and it's the only Augustinian university in the United States. Mm -hmm. The Augustinians used to be 
a very, very um, committed order to um, higher education. Before the Reformation under Henry VIII, Oxford was run by the Augustinians. Mm. And uh, so they were a very um, intellectual and scholarly group. Um, the, um, gosh, all of a sudden I can't think of his name, that developed um, hybridization in, in biology. Oh, oh, gosh. I can't. No, 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 not Darwin. Um, that would be the antithesis. Um, darn, I can't think of his name. Um, that we gave out an award every year, and he was an Augustinian. The father of, of genetics. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, well, it'll come to me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so I, we didn't have any of his publications, or especially the publications that were published when he found his rule of genetics. And so I got a campaign going, and we ended up raising the money and buying the publication, the initial publication that he he, he distributed his... I can't think of his name. Um, no, I feel bad to this. Let's see if I can find it. Oh, I'll find did you say that he had a connection as an Augustinian? He was an Augustinian. Okay. And uh, and it's probably one of the... Okay, father of genetics. Mendelian ta tables. Okay, so we identified that it was Mendel, the Augustinian friar Gregor. Yes, Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel, okay. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, what, you were there for about four years, right? Yes. 96 to 2000? I got there in July of 96. What were some of the challenges you faced initially? Um, replacing the um, library management system. Mm -hmm. It was on notice, I believe. And we had to make a decision about going with a new system. And we chose Endeavor's Voyager, which at the time was quite mm, um, risk-taking. Only one other university had made that decision before then, and that was University of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so I think we were the thec second who had chosen Endeavor's Voyager. And it was a relational database, which at the time was not the way most databases were, were devised. They are now. That's the way they all are. Um, the other challenge we had was making a commitment to um, Ithaca and um, the um, JSTOR titles. Mm -hmm. um, we were the first or second, I think we were the second university library to make a commitment to JSTOR. And um, Kevin Guthrie, who was the director at the time, who's now with Ithaca, um, has always remembered that, that mm -hmm. we, we took this initial lead. And it was thirty-some thousand dollars which at the time seemed like a huge amount of money. But it meant that we had a perpetual discount forever That's on nice. all of the following, all of the, the, the collections that were released later. So that was, that was a challenge. The other challenges were trying to figure out how to renovate the old library. The old library was built in 1950. And it was more or less a storage facility. And I um, really wanted to figure out a way to make it useful and integrated into the building. I didn't succeed on that. I did succeed in getting the archives and special collections situated in a much better space. Mm, that's good. Um, and we also started a lecture series while I was there. And we had people like um, oh, Khrushchev's son. I can't think of his first name. Nikita Khrushchev's son. And then I also had the grandson of uh, Winston Churchill speak. And uh, so it, it was a series that I started to very much like the Distinguished Lecture Series here at Purdue. Mm -hmm. um, and actually it was much more attended there than it was here, than mm -hmm. it has been here. 
although we did it during the afternoon and maybe that would have been better um, and we did it right in the library so those were some of the biggest challenges um, I was going to ask you about your major accomplishments too and you've already mentioned several as part of that um, renovating the old library which didn't happen but you moved it the was archives. done now that's good mm -hmm. It's been done. And I had the question about what prompted distinguishing the, the Distinguished Lecture Series to be created and the faculty book and research talks. Mm -hmm. Those kind of the same yeah. in your mind as I had. I had um, faculty come who had been who had published a book recently and asked them to talk about their research, so that the librarians would learn more about how faculty go about uh, doing their research. And, and the critical role that libraries and archives play. That's great. Did you find it challenging to change to implementation of a book approval plan while you were there? Do you remember anything about that? Mm, I think so. I think that was it. Oh, the other big thing that we took on was information literacy. Oh. Um, I've been committed to information literacy. I think I mentioned to you in our last oral history about finding out that when I was doing my my um, research for my in library school and found out that I had missed all these materials when I was working on my honors thesis mm -hmm. that I've always been very committed therefore to information literacy and when I was at um, Villanova I approached the university administration and they had a core humanities course that every student had to take business engineering all of them had to take and it was more or less a course in history English philosophy and I wanted to have the information literacy component in there. Mm -hmm. And and the faculty all said, no, we cannot give up any time for that. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'll require that, your student, that the students go to lectures in the evening. And we had, we had workshops, or we, we had workbooks that students had to do. Um, and we, um, we did... Oh, it was kind of like a, rep, a basic reference class mm -hmm. in library school. And I told the, told the provost and the faculty, I said, this will fail. I said, you cannot have this separate from the class. I said, it has to be in the course. It has to be embedded in the course. And, and they said, well, we're not giving up the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it came back and it had failed. Had so the then, libraries done any instruction no, at that point? Okay. No. And uh, so then what we did was we came up with a different technique. We tested about three sections of the court of the students before they took any instruction. Then we tested them after they had taken the instruction. And then we gave it to a statistician on campus and asked him, can you tell us that there's any st significant difference between the student's knowledge before and after our instruction? He came back and he told me, Jim, if every professor could be assured that their students had learned as much in the classes, in their class, as the students have obviously learned in what your librarians have taught, they would be overjoyed. Oh, it was highly significant. Mm -hmm. And after that, the faculty could not argue with this, mm -hmm. and they integrated it into the course. Oh, that's wonderful. At that time was when I required that all librarians had to teach, mm -hmm. and that was a challenge, because as one, one or two librarians told me, it said, listen, I chose to be a librarian because I want to be a teacher, <laughs> and now you're making me teach? And I said, yes, that's an expectation. And I was in there too. I, 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 we had always two librarians together, one teaching and another one using, helping the students use the resources, the computers. And we were integrating at that time Boolean logic to help understand how students could understand how to create searches. Mm -hmm. And and some of the librarians were incredibly good instructors. And I was always very pleased when, we, when I left there, we had a very, very robust information literacy program. I was very disappointed when my successor stopped it mm. because he was getting some pushback from the librarians, and to me that was a disservice to the students, um, really a disservice. Um, and so, but as I got through Villanova, and I really enjoyed living in Philadelphia, Kathy and I both really liked it. Mm -hmm. um, Kathy took a job 
um, in New Hampshire at uh, Strawberry Bank, which is a historic village. And she, uh, so then I wasn't commuting to Virginia, I was commuting to Boston, or to, to uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is north of Boston. And now it wasn't six hours or five hours or six hours, it was now eight to nine hours. And so I had to fly most of the time. I had to fly from Philadelphia to uh, either Manchester, New Hampshire, or Boston. And I did that for maybe a year and a half when I said, we, I just can't continue doing this. It was just too hard. And uh, so I also realized at that time that the job that I really wanted was to be the dean of a research university library. But I didn't have enough research library and research university experience. Yes, I worked in Bloomington, but only for, what, three years, four years. But I didn't really get involved in the research because the law library was very different. When I went to South Bend, we had no doctoral programs. We had no sponsored research, so I did not have experience with that. Villanova had very little sponsored research, only had doctoral programs and a very few disciplines. And I knew that I could not make the jump at that time to being a dean of a, of a major research university library. Mm -hmm. So knowing I wanted to go up to the Boston area, I saw an announcement for associate director or assistant director for um, planning and administration or operations administration. I can't remember now what the title was. Do you see it there? Associate director for administration? Yeah, that must have been it. And, uh, and I saw that at, Villano at MIT. Well, I did some research, and MIT had a record of sending out probably a higher percentage of its associate directors to become directors or deans at other universities, Was Washington University in St. Louis, um, Dartmouth, um, NC State, Duke, um, and just a large number of, of people had their start at MIT. And so I knew it would be a good place to be a jumping off point. Also, I knew that MIT would give me a, an insight into research that I would never get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and so I applied, and as I told the director at the time, I said, you know, I can be an incredibly good associate director because as director, I know what an associate director should do and should be able to accomplish. Never realizing that it was going to be very hard for me to give up being the person <coughs> who created the vision and called the shots. Mm -hmm. I was now the facilitator and not the person who was implementing or conceptualizing. That was quite a shock. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that transition. Um, so you're at a much larger research university now. You have responsibilities that are kind of concentrated in specific areas. Mm -hmm. And what was that like to go from being the one in charge? Well, it was hard. Um, and MIT was an environment that I had never been in, and that is science and engineering. Mm -hmm. Even though that technically I was not directly involved in science and engineering, you couldn't be at MIT without having to know a lot about science and engineering. Mm -hmm. It just pervades the place. And the... Um, the level of people in the libraries were exceptional. They were extremely good, and probably the sharpest people I'd ever worked with. Um, and so that was challenging. The other part that was challenging was there was no money. Mm -hmm. um, even though you would think that MIT would be a place where money would come rolling in, it did, but only in particular areas and in support of research. And the scientists and engineers, they had a lot of money coming in from research. They had very wealthy, successful alumni. Um, but libraries are not one of the key factors in the scientists and engineers' minds about supporting their research. Mm -hmm. So the libraries really were very, very low on the totem pole for support. The facilities were in terrible shape, staffing was short, um, 
and it and the budgeting was very challenging because the universe the institute allowed people allowed organiz, allowed the units to over commit their funds and by doing that but what I'm what I mean by that is if everybody was employed in the libraries that technically was employed on July 1st we could not have paid them in the full year we at least 10% and maybe it was even 20% we did not have the funding to pay everyone because it was just assumed some people would leave well that was what we had to hope uh-huh. if no one left or, or retired or departed we could not have paid all of our bills and so every year I would have to think okay who's going to leave and then we would have to hold that position vacant for the remainder of the year Mm -hmm. because we couldn't go into the hole we couldn't go into the red and we couldn't carry money forward so we had to we had to come in as close to zero and above zero as we could and and the budget I was managing was maybe 20 million or 24 million and I would get it so that we would be down to the final um, end of the fiscal year with about three thousand or two thousand, three thousand dollars left in our budget, mm-hmm. just enough so that we had something left, and uh, and it was a challenge. I heard since then that they allow money to be carried forward, um, which is which is great. Um, when, but th- when they hired you, did they have any big projects in mind that they wanted you to take the lead on, or did you kind of? determine that once you got there? Well, there were various projects. Some of them I was more or less put into. Shortly after I arrived at MIT, the I was driving to work, and it was announced on the radio that President Vest, Chuck Vest, had, had decided that they were going to put all of the course material at MIT online, and it was called Open Courseware. And I remember thinking, boy, I don't remember hearing anything about this. <laughs> and I got to work, and my boss, the director, Ann Wolpert, called me up to her office and said, I'm supposed to be on this work group to plan this open courseware. I can't do it. It's too much time. So I want you to be on it. So I did. And, and I knew almost nothing about it. Um, and I went to the first meeting, and it was it had representatives from all over the institute. And the task force was chaired, co-chaired by two faculty, one scientist, one engineer, distinguished faculty. And then there were people from Booz Allen were there as consultants, and uh, and then there were people like me from all over the campus, supposedly bringing our expertise in to figure out how to do this. Well, it was a real challenge because none of us quite understood what we were doing. We didn't know what our options were, and wasn't it, this kind of early for it was very early on. Looking into that? It was two thousand, and yeah. uh, and so it was the first attempt to really bring distance learning to the to the masses, mm-hmm. kind of like the MOOC mm-hmm. became later. The they had to bring all the faculty on because the faculty were kind of resistant. Um, but we, but the problem was, no one knew how to knew what the technology was. Mm-hmm. We had no idea how to how to program this. Mm-hmm. So this is when I learned about how scientists and engineers think differently than a humanist, and that is, everybody sat around the table, throwing out ideas. Not me. I, at that point, I had no idea. And but everybody was throwing out these ideas: computer scientists, engineers, um, scientists. And and I remember thinking, this is chaos, absolute chaos. <laughs> and uh, and by the end of the meeting, somebody said, well, let me go and look at this program. Somebody says, well, I'm going to go look at this. And somebody said, well, I'm going to check into this. And I thought, well, this is a mess. And, and as a humanist, I would have gone out and said, okay, let's figure out what readings we need to do, um, share those readings, and then I'll come back and discuss them. And then each of us try to convince everyone else that we had the right idea. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we came back, I think, a week later. People said, you know, I tried this, but I don't think that's going to work. Oh, that's interesting. But I think if we make this adjustment, it might... And I thought, my God, this is still chaos. Mm-hmm. But by the third week, things started pulling together. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, 
I saw the beauty of the way in which engineers and scientists approach a problem. That they experiment, mm -hmm. they do trial and error. That is not what a humanist does. And, uh, and so I started realizing I really like this. I like this idea that you don't have to have all the answers up front. You just have to know what the problem is and what your options are to get the solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so within a few months, we were going great guns. And within the deadline, I think we had a deadline of four or five months. It was by the summer, I remember. Um, it was up and running. Wow. And, uh, and it was pretty amazing. Now, the other thing that was working going on at the same time was D-Space. Mm -hmm. um, D-Space was already in progress when I arrived at MIT. It was a joint project between Hewlett Packard and the MIT libraries. And I, um, so I got there just when they were doing all of the programming. Mm -hmm. And when they unveiled it, I remember sitting in the room seeing what they were doing, and they were showing us how to do searches. And my comment was, because I was a cataloger, I said, but there's no taxonomy here. Mm -hmm. How are you controlling any of this? How are you providing access? And they said, well, you can put any word in. And you can." And I said, but without some kind of a taxonomy, how do you know what you're getting is everything that's in there? And, uh, and that's when we started realizing the incredible need of metadata. Mm -hmm. um, but open D space is still seen as one of the um, valued um, database management systems and in the in the libraries in the country. It has limitations. D space was created not as a repository so much as an, a way in which to move forward documents that were created on a particular software. So like you might have Word 2.0. And then by the time you get to Word 2.7 or 3.5, it can no longer read the document mm -hmm. that was 2.0. Mm -hmm. And so we had agreements from um, Microsoft and from others that they would give us the source code to allow us to then keep that and then modify it in order to make it so that the different later generations would still be um, usable and, mm -hmm. and legible. Because the fear we had was that with the constant changing in the software, there would be documents that couldn't be preserved because mm -hmm. we couldn't read them. And and that's really what they were working towards. DSpace has since then become more of a, of a repository. But it's not a good repository because it is more or less by item. Mm -hmm. It's not not a composite, so it, it doesn't work as well as I think it might have done for for documents. Um, as it, it doesn't work for data sets at all. Oh, I see. Um, so, anyway, we're about out of time again, and so that was about. I was at MIT, and as when I was at MIT, I started realizing the sooner that I get out of here and get to be a dean someplace, the happier I'll be. Mm -hmm. Um, I did not get along particularly well with, with the director, Ann Wolpert. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed the peop I really enjoyed the time of being an assistant director because all of a sudden I had peers mm -hmm. and, and I had an associate director for collections, associate director for public services, um, and I had people I could do things with and we could commiserate. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're the director, you don't really have anybody like that. Mm -hmm. And, uh. But when I was associate director, all of a sudden I had colleagues and I had peers and I enjoyed them very much. Um, the other thing that I found as a challenge at, at MIT was a different work ethic than I had ever seen before. I had never seen anything like it. I had never been around people who tried to game the system so badly. Mm -hmm. Always trying to figure out how they could get out of work. And, uh, and I had to fire my responsibility was HR, finance, and facilities. Mm -hmm. And and so when it came time to somebody being fired, I had to do it. And I fired more people in those three, four years than in my entire career before. Wow. And, and That's since. That's difficult. Well, usually it wasn't because usually they deserved it. Mm -hmm. um, and 
the one thing that in a private institution you can do is you can let people go a lot mm -hmm. easier than you can in a public institution. I, I've had the experience now of working in both public and private universities. There are pluses and minuses in both ways. The plus of a, of a, of a private university is things can get done much faster and you can bypass a lot of, of um, bureaucracy and there's more flexibility in what you want to do. This negative, the negative of the private institution is there may sometimes be channels that you're not aware of mm. and decisions can be made outside of what appear to be the normal channels. At Villanova, it was the Augustinian order that I was reminded when I went there, remember, they're the, they're the family that owns the place. Mm. It's like a private company and the, the Augustinians own it. And there was always an Augustinian in every unit. And so you had a sense that the Augustinians were all kind of watching. Mm -hmm. And they would have, they could easily relate to the president because the president was an Augustinian. So they could be, they had a direct channel to him. So you had an administrative channel that was typical. But then there was this other channel that you never quite knew what was being said or how it was being interpreted. Mm -hmm. so that you had a sense that you were being reported on outside of any kind of a traditional um, hierarchy. And I... Um, but then the, the, the benefit of the public university is things are more... There's more of a process. The process is more defined, and it's a bit more public. And, but it's also more cumbersome. So it sounds like you kind of had in your mind when you applied for the position that this would be a, a way to prepare for oh, your yes. ultimate goal of being a yeah. dean of a major. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I knew I had to do it. Uh -huh. when, I, when I left Villanova to become associate director, I also wanted to be in closer to Kathy.